Welcome to Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo and teaches you a thing or two about the animals we see. And if this is your first time, I really recommend you hit those like, sub, and bell buttons to, you know, get free walkthroughs of America's zoos. To start this episode, I want to announce that I've teamed up with Fallow to bring you the bracelet that lets you track sharks, sea turtles, polar bears, elephants, and more. Each purchase comes with an info card that includes your animal's name, their life story, and a QR code to see what they're up to right on your phone. Best part is, some of your money goes to these guys. They save animals. Be sure to use the promo code ZOOTORS to get 20% off your bracelet. Lions, tigers, and jaguars. Welcome to the channel's debut of the Jacksonville Zoo. Home to 2,000 animals and 1,000 plants, these gardens have been going strong since 1914 and are really a big reason why Florida just might be the best state for zoos. And I'm just going to say you can go ahead and add it to your bucket list. Now, as for our tours, I'll show you the award-winning African forest and the primates of the old world, award-winning range of the jaguar and jewels of the new world, and again, the award-winning Land of the Tiger and the disappearing realm of Southeast Asia. But it all kicks off with Africa. The Africa Loop is a 14-acre 1996 overhaul. And to spoil things just a little, this episode will include a record-breaking tortoise, an elephant with a thrilling backstory, a lion roar-off, a giraffe marathon, and I'll even talk a bit about the zoo's upcoming master plan. Before we begin, I'd like to thank my new zoo friend, Johnny, for joining me on my visit and offering some Jacksonville Zoo info. So to thank him, I want you to please follow his Instagrams with the links that are in the description. If it isn't suffering football fans, one thing that comes to mind when I think of Jacksonville is a walk-in flight cage. Right out of the gate is the River Valley Aviary and it would still be a quick circle around the African Rift Valley if it weren't for the vacationers that overstayed their welcome. I'm looking at you, North American Ruddy Duck, but you're still surrounded by eight other natives. The White-Bellied Stork, the Waldrap Ibis, the Hadada Ibis, Yellow-Billed Ducks, African Spoonbills, I guess proving once and for all that fish can properly be cut and eaten with spoons. Off in their own space outside of the aviary, I was able to focus on hammer cops. The showboaters, though, were the plentiful yellow-billed storks. They were everywhere, in the trees, in the water, and the only ones willing to give us a proper flight demonstration. Now, when you get out of the poop zone, there's more. I was just lucky enough to get the cold shoulder from this milky eagle owl, but they were probably just looking at all the colors next door that were made by the blue-bellied rollers. More wall-drap ibises, boat-billed herons of South America, cape teals, and the violaceous taracos. The official entrance is across the train tracks and begins in the plains of East Africa. Coming up on the left until 2011, it was a crocodile swamp until the Great Greater Flamingo Raid of 2016. What makes them live up to their name? Well, they're the biggest and most widespread of all the flamingos, which I guess makes them think that they're better or greater than the rest too. Now speaking of big, it's time to say hi to the old man, Goober, the Aldabra giant tortoise, who's been in Jacksonville off and on since 1968. He's been around so long that he fathered the first hatchings of his kind in the Western Hemisphere. And not to poke fun at his age and his weight, but it's worth saying that he's also over 400 pounds and he loves his veggies. So take this as a lesson, kids. If you eat right, you can grow up to look just like this goofy Goober. After what feels like forever, I can finally talk about some of the channel's few warthogs. Everyone at some point, except for me, goes through some sort of phase where their face gets a little bumpy. For warthogs, they might call it a blessing. They're not helping them win any piggy pageants, but the warts are useful. These bumps, which are actually growths, serve as a type of armor. When a male charges at another male with those sharp canines, the warts can shield their face and their eyes from the blow. And the bigger they are, the better. Well, they were living the Hakuna Matata life. I caught these waddled cranes working up a dance number. Actually, it was a courtship ritual between what I assume is a breeding pair. Together, they'll shake their tail feathers, clack their beaks, throw their heads back, toss a bunch of sticks around, and my favorite, jump as high as they can, all part of an elaborate ceremony to strengthen the bond between the couple. If 
they get up high enough to look in this fantastic forest, they should see eastern bongos. They're more than just a kind of drum, they're a kind of antelope, not of the savanna, but of the tropical forest. And they're full of secrets and surprises. In this case, not one, but two babies were born in the last couple years. Like humans, the gestation period is around nine months. But imagine that baby is 50 pounds and starts walking shortly after birth. But calves don't follow mama right away. She'll leave her baby hidden in the greenery and only come back to nurse. A couple of weeks later, the little one can join the rest of the herd. Three and a half months later, their horns start to show. And in six months, they're taken off the bottle and reach maturity before they even turn two. At another time, I'll talk about why every bongo birth, wild or in a zoo, is very important. I didn't even notice this on my fourth time through, but over in this corner is Steve the cheetah. If you see him run, due to an injury that he received as a cub, he has a slight limp. But don't worry, it doesn't slow him down. The boardwalk then gives a side view of the bongo forest, while the other side overlooks a 1.75 acre savanna, the biggest habitat in the zoo, home to a pretty big mix. Greater kudu, male, females, and a youngster of their own. A red-necked ostrich, the last one of its kind in an AZA zoo. They have the pleasure of hanging out with southern white rhinos, Gabby, Capenzi, and Archie, the fifth oldest rhino in the US and the second oldest known male rhino in the world. Looking right across the other side of the watering hole, it looks like I just missed their okapi, but there still was a blue crane in his place. Speaking of which, right next door to them is a hoofed mammal that people constantly refer to to identify okapis, zebras. There are three living kinds. Plains is the most common. This is a grevies. One way you can tell them apart is from their stripes. Everyone says they're like finger or thumbprints. No two zebras have the same pattern. A grevy stripes though are far more narrower and straighter. And if they just happen to show you their backside, it looks like they take that thumbprint rule almost literally. Around here is also where you can get your third view of the bongos, but it's also where I found out that they live with yellow-backed dikers, another hoofstock from Central Africa. Now it's time to head on inside to the reptiles of the Serenera. Yeah, I know, a reptile house, finally. The first in line to play hide and seek is a Gaboon Viper. And whatever you do, try not to stare too much at the shield-tailed Agama's butts. There's nothing wrong with them. Instead of a tail, there's a spike ball. Where they come from, there aren't too many rocks for hiding. So they make their own burrows and dive head first, closing the hole with their tail and thus giving their six a little protection from anyone who's willing to eat them. Coming in at just three inches is the critically endangered turquoise dwarf gecko. Their small size unfortunately reflects their population and range, which only spans five square miles in Tanzania and they choose to refuge on one species of tree. Next to him are Hankel's leaf-tailed geckos. And lucky for us, they're always easy to find, because apparently they've never heard or seemed to care about this little thing called privacy. Right around the bend, you're met with the puff adder, which isn't much of a people snake. They're responsible for the most snake bite fatalities in Africa. But I did find that others say the Cape Cobra holds that title. Couldn't really confirm the numbers. Regardless, they also have some of the most toxic venom of the African snakes. My fave of the building was the Meller's Chameleon. Contrary to popular belief, they don't camouflage based on their environment, always. Their pigments change based on their stress levels, when they want to mate, and even depending on what the temperature is. Another reptile that prefers life in the trees is the Western Green Mamba, which allowed me to see their full size, which can be between 4 to 7 feet long. But that doesn't compare to the size of what's at the end of the hall, the African Rock Python. They're looking at Africa's largest kind of snake. Do you know that Burmese python problem Florida has? Well, turns out the rock python has also been here for years, and they're actually considered the more aggressive of the two, and able to take down and swallow anything a Burmese python can tackle as well. The reptile building then opens up into the elephant plaza and the zoo's African savanna elephants. There's one main yard that comes out at around 36,000 square feet. This exhibit comes with a tree stump filled with hidden trees. Another tree stump that they've actually broken down with their tusks so they can eat any fallen bark. 
There's also a giant shade structure and a 275,000 gallon pool, useful for that Florida heat. But I didn't expect to see any swimming because when I went, it was a freezing 56 degrees. Jacksonville has three. Tondi is thought to have been born in 1980. She spent some time in Washington State and the magical Disney's Animal Kingdom before making her way to Jacksonville. She lives with Sheena, another female that joined the zoo in 1985. In case you couldn't tell them apart, Sheena doesn't have tusks. She was born without them, which only happens to at most 4% of female African elephants. No offense to the girls, but my heart skipped a beat when I learned about Ali, because he comes from royalty. Not that kind. That's better. I don't know how he got him, but Ali lived at Michael Jackson's house for four years in his own menagerie. Though apparently Michael had too many mouths to feed at the time and sent his pachyderm pal to Jacksonville in 1997. Ali was all by his lonesome on my visits, which is normal by nature for a lot of males. This exhibit is sort of away from the public, but not out of view. I'll talk about later what their master plan has in store for these giants. I'll just say for now, it looks like it'll more than triple their current space. This plaza also has a few aviaries. I think this one had high raxes, but I saw more blue-bellied rollers. Not the best trade, but they're lucky they're pretty. Connected is an old-fashioned flight cage. I didn't see the straw-colored fruit bats, but I did catch glimpses of the golden-breasted starling and the white-crowned robin chat. The plaza's final stop is open-topped and fenced in by a swamp in the back. The property comes with a faux zebra carcass, sure enough to make any lion jealous. Lappet-faced vultures and their nest. They can build it to be 7 feet wide and 2 feet deep. I don't know if this pair follows the rule or not, but some lappet couples won't even use the nest until an egg has been laid. Usually they're in trees for safekeeping, but it's okay here. It's also being guarded by a wild turtle. After a decent walk onto another boardwalk, you'll come towards a heavily vegetated enclosure. Once the site for colobus monkeys, now a Siamang of Southeast Asia, which came from the Great Apes region that you know now as the African Forest. So for the sake of geography, we'll be moving on. Right across is what the zoo calls the Mahalipa Simba, or the place of the lion. At nearly 15,000 square feet, it should be within the top 10 list of America's biggest lion homes, and it comes with a pretty clear view of the elephants in the distance. The master plan says the elephants will get this one day, while the lions are going to be in place near or on the River Valley Aviary to be a part of one of the zoo's grand entrances. And you can read more about it below. By the way, this is not just an exhibit. It's a soundstage, and the cats weren't just lying around. I could hear them testing out their exhibit's acoustics. <laughs> But things kicked up a notch when both males turned the song into a duet. The boardwalk finally ends to one more aviary, no longer home to spots of a leopard, is full of feathers of more yellow-billed storks, more African spoonbills, wall-drap ibises, and crested screamers of South America. And we are not done yet. If you walk on the next boardwalk down the main path, this is where you can see the back part of the elephant complex. But Johnny also spotted an unsigned clip springer in what appears to be an old transfer yard. And if you keep going, you'll reach the giraffe overlook. Added in 2005 at a cost of just under 3 mil, a close family of reticulated giraffes roam this acre and a half field. If we discount bush gardens, this is the most fun I've had at a giraffe exhibit. Of course I did the feeding, and I learned that the zoo's full experience package was worth it. Feeding a giraffe never gets old, and always make sure to have someone with a camera ready. Oh, and who day, by the way. Sorry, I had to do that. As soon as I showed up on the second day, they just started running. I mean, I'm not that rough to look at. Still, it was obviously a sight to see. A giraffe's top speed is 38 miles per hour. It can't outrun a lion, but for an adult, it's nothing that a good kick to the face won't fix. Can't really imagine this herd has much to run from, but the man in charge just took off, and luckily, the herd followed. 
The plan says the giraffe overlook will be converted into a flex habitat with the elephants, which means the two might rotate around multiple yards. It kinda also looks like there will be an enclosed elephant trail around the perimeter, similar to the National Zoo's elephant walk and the outer trails in Jacksonville's own Land of the Tiger. And that wraps up the first of many tours of the Jacksonville Zoo. Next time, it'll be Wild Florida's chance to shine. But by the time we get to it, some things might look a little different. So stay tuned, remember to support your local zoo, get a bracelet and don't forget that promo code, and thank you for watching.